Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk About It. This is Susan Johnson, and my very special co-host is not with us today. He is out doing great stuff all over the community, as he usually does. He is an amazing person, but he's not here today, but we have an amazing guest. We're very, very pleased to have Bill Carell uh, with us today. He is a local volunteer, and he has a business which has to do with computers and his knowledge and history of computers is just uh, probably no one else has anything like it so i'm just really thrilled because i know i bought a computer from bill and uh back in the day and i know he's still doing that work so welcome to the show bill so glad you're here and thank you so much for all the great volunteer work you do thank you susan it's a pleasure to be here and i'm really happy to be sitting next to you and again for the second time this week and the third or fourth time in the last couple of weeks it's fantastic well you have been wonderful and i i you know i just have to go back a little bit with my history with you and that goes back to back in the late 90s when you helped to develop the neighborhood revitalization zone the nrz has just been a wonderful functional thing that has helped so many businesses and helped with a gateway to our community and one of the things that i was thrilled about with the nrz is that i was able to utilize the fact that we had it to help with the julio de borgos park I actually am aware of that, and it was fantastic. Um, that all started with a man named Nick Carbone, who used to be an under deputy, de, uh, mayor's deputy, deputy in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, and then he got some money from the federal government and started a small cities uh, enhancement uh, uh, consulting group, and we put through the uh, uh, the you know at the state level an or ordinance change that uh, with a six month process or whatever it was. Um, you could create a neighborhood revitalization zone. Allowed people to do common sense things like, you know, encapsulating lead, you know, putting a, a paint over windows that had lead uh, glazing, et cetera, et cetera. And that kind of made it easier for uh, to, to, to get around some of the other really difficult uh, local ordinances having to do with, with facilities. And we had a lot of them that were in disrepair in those days. Well, we're still working on that, but if uh, thanks to your work, and I was able to join the Neighborhood Revitalization Zone uh, process or, and group uh, that you had started, and I was thrilled to be part of that. And that's how we were able to create the uh, Julio de Borges Park. And because of the NRZ, we were able to get a nice nice wrought iron fence right there so little children while they were listening to the concerts wouldn't run out into the street sure and that was really one of the great things of creating that you know that julia de borges park was one of the things that we were able to create when i was on the council back in the day yep. or it was now before that it was the board of selectmen that's when it was the board of selectmen that we did that and it was really something that we had the we we had the uh, curbstone press and Juan Perez, who was, I think he was on the count, the Board of Selectmen, probably the term before, but he's also very connected to the Curbstone Press. And uh, and they had that empty lot across the street from right. them. And it was a house that had burned down and sat there for 10 years, and the town struggled mightily to get control, and they finally did. And then we put in, a bunch of people came into the, uh, the our council meeting, unbeknownst to me, and they asked us to do something with that park. Yep. And I made a motion to add it to the agenda. And we were able to add it to the agenda. And then everybody voted in favor of having the town take it over and creating a park. And it was called Julio de Borgos because Julio de Borgos is an internationally recognized Puerto Rican poet. And so I was thinking, what a great thing to do in this community to have uh, somebody who has been internationally recognized as a poet uh, working with uh, having that whole, there's a whole uh, poetry book on it and having uh, having that recognition going on and having the little children, the Puerto Rican children and all the children, all, all children here, but especially the Puerto Rican children to feel so more connected to the community. We have so many different things like the museum that uh, goes and it talks about the Italian immigrants and the French immigrants and, and the Irish immigrants. And so this is another way to be able to connect with people who are not really immigrants, Puerto Ricans are part of the United States, of course, but they uh, have come here uh, to work in the factories and do all kinds of work here. So they had migrated, not immigrated, 
uh, to to hear it. And some people get confused about that, but I want to make sure we're clear that they uh, Puerto Rico is part of the United States. Yeah, it is a territory, and uh, there are a lot of people who think it should stay as a territory, and then there are other people who think it ought to become our 51st state. But I will tell you, um, one thing kind of led to another. I started off uh, in 19... Uh, 90 when I incorporated my business I moved it back over to Main Street from Manchester in 1992 and then I got uh, interested in a young lady named Diane Stockton who was pretty much the gal Friday for Walter Polakevich and we started talking about you know the the vacancies in the buildings and what it, what it looked like and all the problems that, that were there and we really didn't hold out a whole heck of a lot of a hope for people to just come into the area so we started talking about how do we do downtown revitalization work this is 92 when we started that conversation well, we got together and we got the uh, the, the, the the select uh, select board of selectmen to give us a twenty five thousand dollar grant you know to go out and uh, uh, do a study on what would it take to attract uh, anchor uh, Food, restaurants, that sort of thing, and what we ended up with was about a year-long process with some really great consultants, including a man named Jack Dollard, uh, and Jack was a very, very accomplished uh, ar architect. He worked for Aetna. He was actually an attache to the president of the corporation, and uh, Jack just came with these marvelous drawings, and it uh, was a lot of fun, but one thing led to another, and then we started talking about replacing Put, I'm, I'm tapping on the uh, table here because I have that habit. Anyway, uh, we started talking about replacing the, the bridge. And uh, so we started, you know, John Lesko was our, our in, in the job that you now hold uh, at the time. And, and uh, we went to John with a really crazy idea. And we said, look, we don't just want another bridge. We don't want it to look like everybody else's bridge. So let's go ahead and build a bridge that's an architectural design bridge, which would have been the first one since the 1890s, back when the Merritt Parkway was done. It was a wonderful idea, and the first part of that bridge, and I used to have a drawing of it uh, that was architectural drawing uh, that I bought at one of the fundraisers, and I have it framed in my TV room, and it is, it's just the ones with the thread uh, spools, and that was the initial design, which was really nice, I thought, but then uh, Don Phillips came along and wanted to put frogs on the bridge, legendary Connecticut, the professor from Eastern Connecticut State University, who was a wonderful, wonderful person, a wonderful and his, his his son Dave Phillips is still uh, he's at legal services now we've had him on the show doing uh, he's doing uh, pro bono uh, uh, work trying to work and get other lawyers to come and do pro, pro bono work at legal services but I digress anyway so it was his work where he was able to actually get together with everybody and I remember buying the pins that he was selling with little frogs on it yeah. and frogs and spools and we were able to get those frogs put on them Bridge. So, so we, uh, we we hired an, an artist uh, to do the sculpture, and we had an economic development meeting one morning, and they wheeled in a box, and they un unveiled about a three uh, three foot model of what we now have uh, on the Frog Bridge, and we all were you know really amazed because they're so stylized looking, but you know having gone to Florida a few times, I've seen leopard uh, frogs down there, and they kind of look like Floridian leopard frogs they have uh, come to Connecticut well you know there was controversy initially as there always would be in Wyndham and they had to argue about how the frogs looked whether they were green enough and all of those types of things yes. whether they're the right style frog I mean but you know it's a frogs to me and they look great they do look like frogs and I was very pleased with how they appeared absolutely we were told once they were put in place yeah they're kind of coppery bronze looking right now and very shiny but just let mother nature take its course and they'll be beautiful three to four years from now that's right copper turns green in the weather <laughs> and, and that's what it did it absolutely did <laughs> i think it's called verdigris oh, yeah oh very good for you, more, more french here in well, the thank end. you for that yes <laughs> but anyway they they face north east south and west if you haven't noticed and and it's quite quite attractive and uh and every, we we dress them up in the winter with a big big uh you know shawl of some sort 
and I think that we had masks on them for COVID. And I have to say, what a good idea, because the frogs were completely safe. They were. They and were I'm socially sure distanced as well. well. They were, and I'm sure that they'd love to have a vaccination if we could get a needle in that copper. What do you think? I, I think we'd have to hire a specialized person to do that. I don't think that, you know, that, that kid is sitting around in everybody's garage. Well, I probably you're right. Maybe we could go back to the guy that designed them. Yeah. <laughs> a big injection. So, so hey, uh, I love going down memory lane. I absolutely do, but you want to hear some of the things I'm up to these days? I most certainly do. I want to hear it now, but I just wanted to establish all the stuff you've, all, it's not all the stuff you've done, obviously, but, you know, some of the stuff I knew about that you did. What well, kept me off the street, okay? <laughs> and I was actually a serial board member or serial chairman uh, mm -hmm. through, for about 10 or 12 years mm -hmm. until we moved down to Florida for a while. Oh, where'd you go there? Uh, we were in Central Florida, right right by, by Disney. Oh, yes. They have no oh. frogs there. They have mice. Well, they have alligators. Many, many alligators. I had probably alligators. Probably they don't have any frogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had a waterfront. We had alligators there all the time. Mm -hmm. I bet you did. Yeah, well, that was one of the reasons I wouldn't have a waterfront right there. Well, we had a, about a six-foot seawall all around the, the edge of our property, so we could safely sit there and, and look. But, you know, they... well, well, I wouldn't be around there at dusk, right? <laughs> around at dusk. I mean, I remember driving my grandmother around there because she had a place in central Florida. And I said, well, we'll go buy some of the She's in the Lakeville area. And uh, so it's north of where you were, I think. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we're, and I said, oh, my goodness. You could see the the alligators. You could see their just the tops of their heads around when you go by the lake. And I'm thinking, and that was around dusk. And I think that they come out around dusk yeah. primarily. But they, they'll come out any time. Yeah. But it's a uh, kind of an animal thing to come out at dusk. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> so, moving up to today. Uh, I, no, seriously, I really want to give a plug, you know, to my dear friend Ryan Fitzgibbons, who is the executive director of Holy Family Home and Shelter. And uh, Ryan is at home now, and I think we're having a little bit of a an internet technical breakdown because we can't seem to get him on the phone at the moment but we're going to talk about you now my friend we are very very fortunate to have this gentleman you know come to the area he was a longtime resident he went to uh, killingly high school mm -hmm. um, professional soccer player uh, you know then he was did some soccer coaching and he held two really responsible jobs in uh, in Kansas at Wichita I believe one of them was the YMCA and the other one was a, a big outreach you know to uh, uh, the needy and, uh, and homeless people and, and uh, also in that general area but the main thing is is that uh, he's come with that experience with very large organizations and he has a vision for our community and it is community-based it has uh, it stretches far beyond the walls you know over on Jackson Street and the neat part of it is is that w with looking at the way that that the, the the vision is laid out yes it has to do with housing and taking care of the the homeless that they can which traditionally at a uh, holy family has been uh, mostly uh, uh, women and women with children. Well, it's now extended to families. We want to keep the family together as much as possible. And Ryan is doing a, a, an amazing job at kind of, you know, painting up and fixing up a little bit at a time and upgrading the look and the feel of, of the building itself. So in addition to the uh, uh, you know the programs, but in addition to that, he's he's really reaching out to become one of the leaders, in my opinion. But I think he would say just an, another asset. He's a he's a team player. I mean, the guy was a goalie. I mean, you know how crazy goalies are, right? People are kicking stuff at you, you know, hundreds of times a, a game or a week, but. You know, kidding aside, it's a big job, and and quite frankly, uh, we're we're looking for for volunteers. We're looking for people to just know about what we're what we're doing over there and how we're we're, we're trying to uh, end homelessness in this city. And that's kind of a crackpot goal. But remember when we said back in 1995, one of these days we're going to have a place where we can have con concerts on on Gilson Square, or we'll have a parking garage, you know. Or we'll have a, a community center. Holy mackerel. If you... 
Oh my goodness, you're reading my resume. <laughs> exactly. So it has to do with... But it, you know, let me just say, I don't yeah. do it alone. There's no way any of that gets done alone. And uh, and I, I do mention this from time to time on the show. Uh, I've been following the 10-year town plan in my work at yes. the Capitol. You don't, if you don't have it in the town plan, it's not going to get done. And sometimes people would say, well, we didn't know about that. I said, well, did you read the town plan yet? And so <laughs> you got to look at the plan because that's part of the town plan. The University, Eastern Connecticut State University has its town 10-year plan as well. Yes. And so those things that they want to do have to be incorporated in that 10-year plan. That doesn't mean everything that we get that we do gets done uh that we put in the plan rather that gets gets done but if it's in the plan we can say this is part this is it this is what the town has an interest in town has an interest in a garage in a parking garage town has an interest in a stage on jilson square town has an interest in a community slash senior center so those are the things that were there they give credibility to the representative because i can go to the capital i can say this is part of the 10-year plan this is what people have said that they want and then we work together with the council and the people in the town to get it done. And that's exactly what happened. So, so that is really, really how it works. And, uh, you know, people say, oh, it took so long. Well, whatever. But this is part of the plan. It takes as long as it takes, doesn't it, Susan? This bump. You got it. <laughs> the, 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 you know, as, as Jimmy V used to say, don't give up, never give up. You know? Right, right. If you keep your eye on the prize and you just keep walking in a straight line, you're going to get bumped around a little bit, but just get right back after it. The other thing I want to say is is that it's it's a really amazing, you know, we didn't go through through a, a facelift and an upgrade here in Willimantic. We went through a transformation. Mm -hmm. This is unrecognizable to what it looked like in the, in the late 1980s and, and into the 1990s. And the dreams that all of us had, I mean, there were hundreds of people that went to meetings, economic development etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, we lived through a tough time and I won't say the words out loud we got labeled you know as uh, you know uh, as not a safe place to be and and you know well, etc well you know the, the problem is is that you pick on a pick on a group and then it helps uh, helps keep them down right yeah. and that's what that was about any any time you pick on any group it keeps them down instead we should be talking about lifting up and like we just got through okay. saying working together by creating a parking garage by doing a Shabu stage, by having a community center, by having that great bridge with the Frog Bridge, by having the neighborhood revitalization zone with the Julio de Borges Park. All these things are things that were areas of need that we lifted ourselves up and we uh, by our bootstraps and we made it happen and it happens with a group it happens with a group and the thing that i was really really uh, taken with uh, ryan fitzgibbons who is the new director of our uh, holy family home, home and shelter, shelter yeah. uh, is that he is he is focused on uh, what he can do and i want to say that you know Connecticut is very different from Kansas. Yes, and we have uh, we have we have 169 towns, and we have uh, more than 5,000 taxing districts. <laughs> <laughs> this is really important information for a lot of people, by the way. And so, what we need to really understand is how how we're we're divided up into teeny little teeny pieces here, yep. and everybody has a little teeny piece. And what we have to do is have everybody understand what all the other pieces are doing. Now, that's a very hard thing to do. What I say is, you know, when you're sitting in your town, maybe you understand all the different elements of your town and how it works. But what about the town next door? What kind of dem demographics does it have? What is the financing system? What kind of council does it have? Does it have a board of selectmen? Does it have what does it have? Because you know there's something in the in the state statutes uh, called the Home Rule Act, and people can make a charter and they can create whatever kind of town they want. If they don't use that Home Rule Act, then they're going to have whatever town they want. Uh, and they make all kinds of rules up and all kinds of charter charter revisions, taxing districts, all kinds of things, water districts, uh, sewer. Districts districts. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on and on. Educational districts, 200, 200 uh, different um, education districts. And so what we have to take into consideration is all these different things. And by dividing us up so much, it's hard for everybody to follow what's going on. And so the other thing we have to give consideration to 
is the fact that when we work together, we get things done. Now, this is a statewide problem of homelessness. It's not just a Wyndham problem. And so we have to really look at what we're doing as a state that maybe we could correct or make a change in that would be uh, advantageous, not just to Wyndham, but to the entire state to stop the homelessness problem all throughout the state of Connecticut. And by doing that, and this is what I'm so thrilled with, Ryan Fitzgibbons, and we'll, we'll go back to this after we break, but what I'm thrilled about is being able to look at the data that we're collecting and trying to make sense of it in terms of what data is being collected at the state level so we can address what the, where the break is, where the gap is, where the dysfunction is that creates homelessness. And so this is Susan Johnson, and I'm here with Bill Carell, who is the town's great volunteer and has done so many things. And we will be right back after these messages. So thank you so much. Welcome back, everyone. This is Susan Johnson, and I am here with Bill Carell, who is our volunteer who has been helping out all over town who I worked with when back in the day in the 90s when we created the neighborhood revitalization zone and I just have to say when the opportunity zone came along for us to be able to also utilize for development which is some of the reasons that we had Martin Kelly buy some of the buildings on Main Street uh, the opportunity zone what I did is I did what um, what you do is we looked at well let's add that to the neighborhood revitalization zone so the opportunity zone and the neighborhood they're overlapping they, they overlap each other and so this is a good way to to uh, try and do that and uh, at some point bill we have to talk about uh, how what else can we do with these things well see that's that's really the the challenge right now isn't it and i think a lot of it has to do with solving the homeless problem Oh, I don't know. I think that there, there certainly we must solve the homeless problem, no doubt about it. But I think that they're kind of separate. In some well, ways. homeless need to live somewhere, and mm -hmm. these are unloved buildings, and you know, mm -hmm. the right kind of uh, traction of, of money. The opportunity zone was a really excellent idea, but I don't think they allowed it to lo last long enough. It was a one-year no, process. No, no, no. It's it goes to 2025. So, you, so people can still invest? Uh, oh, yes. Yes, 2025. Well, that's good news. Oh, yes. No, no, no. I was just reading about the other day. So, yeah. No, 2025. Fair enough. Well, it's pretty close, though. <laughs> yeah, just so saying. And maybe that maybe President Biden will extend it because uh, it was, uh, I think it was put together. No, it was, it was, it was uh, who's, the, who's the senator from um, New Jersey? Boker, Corey Boker, he's the one that proposed Opportunity Zones, and it got into some of the uh, programs that well, came in under the previous administration. There was a man named Tim Scott, too, who was also the author of that bill, mm. so the senator. So uh, long story short, I don't know what's going to happen with these buildings, but we're better off than we were 30 years ago. Yes, we are. We have, a, we have a plan, we have a vision, and we have people interested in investment. And these are the most important things. But what I'd like to say is, uh, you, in order to address homelessness, people who are homeless have to have an income. <laughs> um, yeah, so that means there has to be local jobs. But I want to tell you well, one no, more. no, it means more than that. It means that there has to be a support for people uh, to get into some type of profession or to get some type of, uh, you know, social safety net. And if you don't have that, then no matter how many buildings and apartments you have, you're not going to be able to address the homelessness because they have to have money to pay the rent. You're not going to get, unless, unless we're all willing to provide free places for people to live. I don't think that's uh, anybody's well, idea of a good time. You know? <laughs> well, so, yeah, so you got to gotta, gotta go with the money. you got to have the me, Keep me, that in mind, though. <laughs> let me just push back for a minute. Okay. You have to have a demand for people to work, and that's uh, what we used to have. We used to have American Thread and Rogers Corporation, and we're, Brand Rex used to employ about 400 people. And I think we probably lost, uh, in terms of uh, uh, semi-skilled to, to highly skilled jobs in this area, probably close to about about 5,000 jobs just, just plain went away in a, in a 10 or 15 year period. Actually, um, there has been a, you know, the uh, Thread City Museum, Jamie Eves did a yep. study. One of the things that he noticed uh, when he did a study, the history of the thread, and he did a wonderful study and I hope to actually have him reproduce that again and, and you just reminded me of that. I'd love to see uh, any, <laughs> and any what factual he said, data. What he said is that when we lost those businesses, we lost about 1,700 jobs Yep. and they actually uh, at 
Eastern Connecticut State University increased their staff to by about the same amount. So we've increased the amount of jobs. So the amount of jobs are still about the same, except that it's not quite the same to work at the university as it would be in one of the mills. And and so let's just go fast forward a little bit more. Yep. And so and because I've been in on this for a while, I've been in a minute or two, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. And so one of my problems with the whole thing is, is that okay? So now we said to the people who have unskilled labor in those types of manufacturing positions. What we have in Connecticut is highly skilled, highly technological types of businesses in manufacturing. The highly technical skilled in bus skilled businesses in manufacturing uh, have been created. We've created something called the manu manufacturing pipeline. But the people who are in the pipeline and then we want to put in the pipeline have to go through some type of training through the community college system. Yes. So what we did just recently is we made community colleges free for people who are just in need of you know some kind of training to get into the manufacturing pipeline or to get into some other type of uh, training so that they can work in a particular business or, or get a skill so that they can actually uh, you know get, and get awesome yes get, yeah. and so here we are so that's where we have to look we have to look at those things that people can do and match them up in the meantime we have to try and figure out how we can get them a social safety net that'll make it so they have they the time eat, to do they it they got to sleep somewhere <laughs> while they're getting their minds straight you know? exactly yeah. I, I agree. And, yeah, and and the problem is, is when you're in in a in a situation where you're really poor to the point where you, you know, maybe you became ill with some kind of disease, or maybe your your significant other became ill and died, or isn't able to work anymore, or you your business left, and now you have and you've got to be able to figure out a way to pay your rent. What you have to be able to do is you have to be able to have that bridge. Now, back in the day, when before the mid '90s. We did have that bridge. We had two bridges, actually. We had one for people who were single, yep. and we had something called the State Assistant General Assistance Program, and every single town had money to give to people so that they would have a place to stay. They could stay where they were, pay their rent until they got situated somewhere else or they got another job. That was eliminated under the Roland administration. Yep. We also had the aid to families with dependent children, which was changed over under Clinton to the it's a federal program to the temporary assistance for needy families. Temporary assistance for needy families was uh, changed. It was, it was a 60 month uh, opportunity for people to go to school, do whatever they need to do, and move on. Under Roland, he cut it back to 21 months. And he also cut the amount of money to be so low that uh, people uh, would be able to work here in Connecticut for about 10 hours and they would be over income for that program. Which doesn't work at all. And what I are you going to do seriously. as a mother with little little baby? Maybe maybe your husband died. Maybe he was killed uh, in the war or something. And uh, and now here you are with little baby and uh, with 21 months. And how are you going to make that work? You're not. <laughs> it does. The the math doesn't doesn't compute. So that's why I say you have to have money to pay the rent. So it's either a solvable problem if you get the right minds working on it someday. Or it's unsolvable and don't do anything. And you and I are not that second person. Well, certainly not. That's why you're on the show, Bill. Huh? Uh, <laughs> after after 35 years of knowing each other, yeah, we're still we're still here, right? Yes, we Just are. Like the, and uh, so we're gonna try and fix the social safety net, so that we can, when we build the apartments, they'll be able to pay the rent. <laughs> question for you: sure. How how can our listeners get involved in supporting that effort? So what we need to do right now, because I was, I, I, there was a group that was started called the Two Gen Group, Two Generations. So it means that you help the mothers and the and the and the children. Two Gen. So the Two Gen Generational Group. We're working together on the social safety net issue, and that's why I, I was talking to Ryan Fitzgibbon because he is really interested in helping, and so are you. Yes. And so we want to make sure that we look at the social safety net because everybody kind of like backs away from the social safety net. And really, if you want to get rid of the homeless situation and put them in spots where they can pay their rent, then you have to really be able to say, oh, you can't just build a housing. They've got to be able to pay the rent, unless, of course, we all want to pitch in and pay the rent for. 
for yeah. you. <laughs> but I think that what we need is to fix the programs that we have a little bit. And the only way we can do that is to get data. And one way to get data and get people interested is to have people who have been through these experiences to give us a chance to talk to them and take their stories down. And at least if they don't want to actually be present to prevent, present the stories, we'd actually like to just have their stories anyway. Sure. And that way we can present them to Ju Jen and then bring them on to session. So, for example, if there's somebody out there that's listening and is called to, you know, to, to contribute to this, how would they get in touch with you? Well, they can call me at 860-423-2085, or they can get in touch with Ryan Fitzgibbons at the Holy, at the Holy, Holy Family and Home Shelter. Holy Family, Home and Shelter. Yes. Or HFHS Community. Yes. Yes, I'll yeah, maybe get it straight soon. And can I give a plug to the website? Would you please? I just gave most of it. It's hfhscommunity.org. Excellent. So please contact us in either of those ways. Now, my, my phone number is in the Chronicle, I think, every week or every month or something. And so people do call me from all over the all over the region. And uh, and I'm glad to help if I can. Uh, and I do try to help. I, I don't promise that you'll have success, but I do make my effort. <laughs> you really do. And I, I, I applaud you because for as long as I've known you, one of the things that I've loved about both you and Dennis is that you, you show up yeah you know and you have to do that in this community but I want to say one more thing about what we have now in Willimannock we have a good reputation yes we do we have now got the status as I understand it of being in the top 20 safest college towns in the United States that is nothing to sneeze at I mean this is a lot of people really caring this is a great set of you know uh, our service people the police department fire department all of the, the elected officials all of the community all the teachers you know the the neighbors we all did that together we transformed it to what it was 20 years ago which was not pleasant to what it is right now which is y'all come visit us see well, yeah, and I think that that is a really excellent point. To be in the top 20 safest communities in the whole country yeah. is quite a thing. And it's something that President Nunez at Eastern Connecticut State University advertises frequently. And also Jim Bolano from the town uh, of Wyndham, uh, who was the economic development director, has been promoting that as well. To get that kind of a rating is just fabulous. And let me just say, it wasn't just me and, and our elected officials. <clears throat> it was also the staff. It was also the taxpayers. 100%. It's all so all the people working together. So, I mean, I can't do it alone. Nobody does this stuff alone. We need good staff, and we have great staff here in the town of Wyndham who have been working hard on these projects. And you don't get money unless the staff works. I mean, I just want to say, uh, you know, we can make a great presentation at the Capitol. But if the, if the rumor is that the staff isn't so great here, <laughs> they're not going to get the money. Right. So you have to have people who function. And we have that. We have people who function, uh, whether it's town government or the education government, edu the Board of Education, rather. Uh, they all function beautifully. We have such a wonderful superintendent, Tracy Youngbird. We have great people, a wonderful mayor, Mayor Tom DeVivo, who has been focused on this community forever. And we have a great town manager and a great economic development person. And so these people really know how to work, and they work hard. And also, I have to say, giving another plug to the staff at the town, is that they've been working with uh, less people than most towns have uh, regionally, and they do a wonderful job. So amazing stuff. True story. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. They're all great people. Yes, they are. And one of the other things we did in the, in the uh, 1990s was to get our first economic development uh, you know, uh, uh, director, uh, Ted uh, Prendergast. Yes, yes, yes. But we, we had an economic development director. We had Ted. We had... Um, Dave Prendergast. Uh, yeah, but before, Ted Montgomery. Be, before Stockton. Diana Stockton was the first one. And then uh, that happened uh, because we had... Uh, we had a uh, we had another group, and we transferred the group from that to economic development. And then over time, we didn't have anybody after Ted. And right. so we had volunteers, which was absolutely yeah. fabulous, but we didn't have any staff. And then, uh, and then I pushed the town, and uh, Neil Beats actually uh, uh, was uh, supportive, and we were able to finally get Jim Bolano, who's been the first one since Ted Pendergast left, which is 
probably 10 years before that, at least. And here's the thing, you know, uh, Jim Bolano is not just a guy, you know, at Aero Diner. He's actually highly thought of all across the state. Uh, there are, you know, organizations for economic development directors, and, and Jim is recognized uh, at least regionally, if not nationally. He's a really great guy. Yes, he is. He came from Danbury to Wyndham, and we were very blessed to get him. He has all kinds of, uh, you know, banking and real estate experience. He's a lawyer, and he uh, really gets what we needed. Plus, he, he gets around to the businesses here he in does. town, and he gets out, and he talks to people. And that's really important, to let the businesses know that we support them. I think that when we started fixing Jilson Square with the community center and the Shabu stage. A lot of the businesses on downtown felt, oh, they're doing something. They're doing something close to us, close to our businesses. And I think that people were pretty happy about that. Yeah. I, I believe they are, as a matter of fact. And I also think that you see a more vibrant Main Street uh, than five, six years ago, for example. Uh, times are a little bit better for a lot of people. And uh, with the parking garage, uh, I, I go in there frequently because, you know, it's like, uh, you know, when you think about it when you're a kid and you know you want to have a retirement home someday, going in that parking garage, I just sit in my car and I look around and they go, they said this would never happen, and here it is. <laughs> well, you're making me feel very good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I just love that garage. And when it was, when they finally, uh, it was right around my birthday, and they finally... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they finally had it open, right? We did the ribbon cutting nice a little bit before. Present. It was a great birthday present. Yeah. So the the grandkids and the whole family were out at, at Stone Row here. And uh, and then we went. I said, well, let's go into Grammy's garage. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and we drove up to the top and we looked at it. And it, it was great. It was, fun. It was really huge fun. But also, I have to give the big plug to Senator Flexer, too. Because without Senator Flexer's push in the Senate, yeah. Grammy wouldn't be able to get this done. <laughs> so, May, so May, had, is, May is quiet but powerful. Uh, very she? powerful, yes. I mean, May has had a lot to do with making the transfer of the community center. Senator Flexer was able to help me transfer it from the access agency down to where it is today. And, of course, uh, then the taxpayers came out and stepped up, and they said, yes, we want a community senior center. And uh, Senator Flexer has been huge. Uh, now we have, of course, I have to say thank you again to Senator Flexer for what she did with working with me again. She's on the Education Committee at the Capitol. So I, we've got the senator representing Wyndham uh, and the region uh, and, and the Education Committee and me. And so what we were able to do when uh, they decided to uh, make the Wyndham High rebuild is new yep. we were able to get 95 percent reimbursement for that Not instead of the shabby. instead of the 80 percent or 79 and a half percent that we were originally getting and that gave the town an extra 17 million dollar boost or so yeah, this is not chump change. No, it's not. And so, so it's really, it is actually reflected. Her work also has helped us with the payment in lieu of taxes problem that we've had for generations. Yep. And uh, so Marty Looney in the Senate proposed a three-tier system. We're in the top tier for the poorest people and the most state and non-taxable uh, properties here. And so, again, uh, Senator Flexer has worked with me to try and get that done. And certainly Councilman Dennis O'Brien went all over the state talking Talking to the mayors Do in you these know towns, him at all? <laughs> Councilman O'Brien, <laughs> me and my co-host, yeah, exactly. you mean my law partner, yeah. you mean my my husband, your partner in life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he went He went to all those places, uh, all throughout the, New Haven, Waterbury, Bridgeport, mayors, uh, Hartford mayor, Luke Bronin, all of them worked together with Marty Looney to make that proposal so that the towns that have all these properties that aren't getting any money would be tiered according to what they could, some of their capacities. There's yeah. still more to do in that area. But, um, you know, I have proposals, as you might imagine, for that as well. <laughs> no doubt in my mind. <laughs> Susan, you are famous for your proposals. <laughs> oh, thank you, Bill. <laughs> so yes, so tell Can me. Can I some give more. a shout out for to a couple other groups we haven't talked about please. much here? Yes, please. A again, the business owners are absolutely fabulous. These people, uh, you know, they take their chances and they do the best that they possibly can. And sometimes it's good, and sometimes not so good. But they also have a very strong faith-based community here. All walks of the churches, you know, and all of the volunteers and the outreach from them. 
Um, going back to Holy Family, we want to connect with everybody. We want to just raise up this great, great community and continue to make it as good as we possibly can. And then um, I think the other group that I'd like to say a little bit something about um, is is the people who keep the, the, this town looking good. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the pride that people have in their homes, you know, the, the, the Victorians that we have, there's a move afoot now, you know, to, you know, reinstate the uh, Victorian home uh, tour. And, and I think that it's something we should get behind as well. Everything that one part of the community, you know, uh, increases, the rest of the community gets better. And I used to say in the NRZ days and downtown revitalization, a community is only as strong as its weakest neighborhood. Yes, indeed. That's so true. And architectural, we have architectural delight here with the Victorian neighbors. And, and we have so many Victorian houses that are great. And to have that pride in the community, it's so wonderful that you mentioned that. But I also want to mention now that you're talking about different groups, is the Wyndham in Interfaith Area uh, uh, Ministry, Wayne, uh, yeah. Wayne, and they do great stuff. And so I want to give a shout out to Victoria Nimorowski for her work. Absolutely. I met her for the first time uh, uh, three weeks ago when we got together. You so, have the last word here, Bill. So. Well, all right. I just want to say, you know, thank you, Wyndham, for making this a beautiful place to raise my children, uh, put them through the school system, and my grandchildren usually come out for a month every summer in the house that we've been in for 44 years, and uh, my business has thrived here uh, for, for 32 years, and I just want to say thank you. This is the greatest community in the state of Connecticut. I agree with you wholeheartedly. This is Susan Johnson with Bill Carell. Thank you so much for being on the show, and stay tuned for our show next Friday at 5, and listen to Let's Talk About It again. <laughs>